Hello and welcome to Lecture 6 in History 361, African American History to 1877 at New Mexico State University. I am Professor Jamie Bronstein and today I'm going to be talking about the American Revolution and African Americans. Um, as you may know from other history classes that you've taken, the short version of the American Road to Independence involved the relationship between Britain and its North American colonies uh, over mainly the French and Indian War, which I mentioned the, the other day. That war that started in 1754 in the um, Ohio Valley on the North American continent and finished up in 1763. Up until that point, uh, Britain had been practicing what historians for a long time called benign neglect, which is to say they allowed the North American colonies to create their own legislator, legislatures or assemblies. And within those assemblies, the voters uh, or representatives of the voters <coughs> were given the autonomy to make certain decisions. Now, historically, um, dating back to the early 1600s, there was this idea in Britain that taxation was the free gift of the people to the crown and that if taxation were demanded by the crown without people's consent, then that was wrong. That was an abuse of power. That was unconstitutional. In the 18th century in the British North American colonies, um, those colonies were not represented in Parliament, which is to say they didn't have any parliamentary representatives who were elected from the colonies. The colonists could not actually cast ballots in the election to Parliament. And so the notion of taxation without representation uh, was important to the colonists. They felt as though if they had to pay taxes to the British crown, but they didn't have any kind of a hand in either designing those taxes or consenting to those taxes, then that was fundamentally wrong. Taxes were in fact levied on the British North American colonies because after the French and Indian War, Britain was in debt. It had uh, incurred a lot of debt as a result of the military buildup uh, to the French and Indian War and the prosecution of that war. And it seemed only fair that uh, the American colonies pay some taxes, but again, um, colonists protested against this. One of the taxes, for example, that they uh, protested was the Stamp Act. Uh, the Stamp Act, a stamp that needed to be paid for to be put on all kinds of correspondence, newspapers, even playing cards, wills, really any legal documents. It should be noted that when colonists protested against Britain's policies, they often invoked an ideology that um, taxation was a form of slavery. Uh, John Locke and the colonists referred to their plight as a struggle against slavery. Uh, the Sons of Liberty called the Stamp Act a plot to enslave Americans. And this rhetoric caught the attention of enslaved African Americans. And it gave enslaved people a new language through which they could articulate their desire to be free. At the time of the American Revolution, African Americans comprised one-fifth of the population of the colonies. And they began to speak the same kind of language that the rest of the colonists were speaking. Black enslaved people in South Carolina joined a crowd of whites protesting the Stamp Act of 1765 and chanted liberty, liberty, which prompted one white politician to dismiss the enslaved people's chant as a thoughtless imitation of whites. In 1764, James Otis called for the abandonment of slavery altogether, noting, quote, the colonists are by the law of nature freeborn as indeed all men are white or black, 
Does it follow that it is right to enslave a man because he is black? Can any logical inference in favor of slavery be drawn from a flat nose or a long or short face? While colonists boycotted British goods, protested taxes on stamps, sugar, and tea, and challenged the British soldiers in their midst, enslaved people took advantage of the confusion and ran away from their masters. Some enslaved people in Georgia and South Carolina fled to swamplands and other unsettled frontier lands to establish what were called maroon communities. In the north, enslaved people fled to urban areas. In 1772, while still a slave herself, Phyllis Wheatley published a poem in which she embraced the revolutionary struggle and used the cause of freedom to speak out against slavery. And there is a, an artist's representation of Phyllis Wheatley, born in Africa, enslaved poet who uh, was freed as a result of her um, great poetic talents. Another way in which African Americans got caught up in the revolutionary fervor was by filing freedom suits in courts. John Adams recalled one such suit in 1766. Jenny Slew, a mulatto woman from Massachusetts, demanded her freedom. Freedom suits also owed inspiration to an event that took place in Britain. In 1772, an American slave named James Somerset ran away from his master while traveling in London and successfully used Britain's court system to win his freedom. The Somerset case's decision said that slavery is such a momentous institution, such an institution of great importance that it can't exist without positive law creating it, that natural law assumes men are free, and in the absence of positive law or man-made law, creating a state of slavery, slavery could not exist. In January 1773, Massachusetts black people petitioned the colony's governor for their freedom. This document, which was written by Felix Holbrook, demanded that blacks be relieved from the quote, unhappy state and condition of slavery. The governor tabled Holbrook's petition, but a month later, Holbrook, Peter Besties, Sambo Freeman and Chester Joy submitted a new petition to the Massachusetts House of Representatives using revolutionary language to make their case. However, their appeal was again ignored. All right, so the point of the freedom suits is you have this um, rhetoric about slavery and about fears of being enslaved by the British crown and white people are spouting this rhetoric. African Americans get inspired by the rhetoric to uh, levy freedom suits against their masters. But in the early days of uh, the situation, the early days before the revolution has started, these freedom suits are largely unsuccessful. Many black Northerners fought with the Patriots during the revolution. Okay, so um, giving you some examples of this, more than 5,000 African Americans are estimated to have fought with the Patriots. Crispus Attucks, a runaway slave from Framingham, Massachusetts, who was of African and Natick Indian descent and became a dock worker in Boston after his escape, was the first category, or the first casualty, sorry, of the American Revolution, depending on how you define the first casualty or when you define the American Revolution as having started. Attucks was killed in the Boston Massacre on March 5, 1770 when he helped to lead a group of more than 30 men in a scuffle with British soldiers stationed on the waterfront. Uh, this is a, a print that was designed by Paul Revere, who in addition to being a well-known silversmith, was also an engraver. And this particular um, engraving is called the Bloody Massacre. It is definitely a piece of propaganda in that there was legal testimony about what actually happened, and it was clear that there was a state of confusion, that the British troops were not firing from five feet away, point blank, into a group of Americans, that they were not being commanded to fire in a straightforward fashion by their captain, 
Um, but even though this is a piece of propaganda, the Boston Massacre was extremely significant. A funeral procession held to honor addicts and four others who died in the Boston Massacre attracted 10,000 people, and the men were buried in a common grave. The Boston Massacre inspired men and women throughout the colonies to join the cause of freedom and emboldened Massachusetts rebels to further the cause. The next act of resistance was the Boston Tea Party. Uh, this happened in December 1773. It had to do with the British insistence that a tax remain on tea after other taxes had been repealed. And in order to prevent the unloading of the tea and the payment of a customs tax on the tea, uh, the Sons of Liberty dressed up as Native Americans went onto the ships, threw the tea overboard, and then got into little rowboats and hit the tea chests with oars to make them sink. The British responded to the colonists' protest and vandalism by enacting more restrictive laws and demanding repayment for the damage that they had caused. So the series of laws that were issued in 1774 were known as the Coercive Acts. They included the Administration of Justice Act, which made it so that um, British people who were accused of crimes against Americans were extradited to Britain to be tried. The Boston Port Act, which closed the port of Boston and thus was kind of like besieging the city in order to punish it. The Quartering Act, by which troops were quartered in civilians' homes. And the Quebec Act, which granted civil rights to French Catholics in Canada, even as American Protestants were having their rights taken away by the British. So this was uh, an extremely uh, controversial stance. Colonists continued to resist. They formed the first Continental Congress in 1774 and threatened to boycott British goods. On April 17, 1775, The British led a surprise attack against the colonists at Lexington and Concord. This attack started the Revolutionary War. You know, it was the first official outbreak of fighting. And why did the British attack Lexington and Concord? Well, they were going there to raid a, um, an armory and ammunition dump so that these materials could be kept out of the hands of the American rebels. Among the first to take a bullet was Prince Easterbrooks, a slave from Lexington who survived to fight in almost every campaign of the war. Another black man fighting at Concord, Peter Salem, was freed by his owners so he could join the Minutemen. Those were the Massachusetts militia troops called the Minutemen because they could be ready in just a moment's time to go fight. He, Peter Salem, also fought at the Bat Battle of Bunker Hill early in the war, where he fired the shot that killed the commander of the British troops, Major John Pitcairn. Lemuel Haynes, a free black man from Massachusetts, fought with the Patriots in several of the world's early bat battles. Haynes described the Battle of Lexington as a fight between, quote, tyrants and, quote, the liberty for which each freeman strives. He went on to write an unpublished manuscript that called for abolition of slavery in the American colonies. By the time that the Second Continental Congress met in May 1775, colonial militias throughout New England had enlisted blacks as well as whites, despite the fact that early militia groups, such as the Massachusetts Committee of Safety established in 1774, had barred slave enlistment. Enslaved people were offered freedom in exchange for their service, and they enlisted in large numbers after northern colonies from Rhode Island to New York promised to free blacks who fought for the duration of the war. Freedom was not instant. Boyro Brinch, a slave who enlisted in the 6th Connecticut Regiment, had a fight for five years before receiving his freedom. 
and yet enslaved people enlisted at twice the rate of white people despite their master's warnings that the British would ship them off to the Caribbean <clears throat> if they were caught. There were fewer black patriots in the South because Southerners questioned black people's loyalty. Uh, they didn't want enslaved people to go about armed. Um, in eight, in, we're going to talk more about the uh, participation of Southern African Americans with British troops, but it makes sense why they would join the British rather than the Americans. In June 1775, George Washington was appointed commander-in-chief of the rebel army, and he was upset by the large number of African Americans fighting with the Patriots. He issued general orders barring their enlistment, but there's little evidence that his decree affected the number of blacks who served. Um, the way that raising troops for the Continental Army worked in this time period was that each town had to provide a quota of soldiers, and towns tended to be not real particular about who it was that they were sending forward. So it tended to be young people, uh, men who didn't have families, uh, people who didn't have a lot of property, maybe homeless people, convicts, and also African Americans. Rhode Island passed a Slave Enlistment Act in 1778, authorizing the formation of a battalion of slaves that would be freed. They were called the 1st Rhode Island Regiment. Among them was a man named Jack Sisson, who had already captured a British Major General, and he was traded back to the British in a prisoner exchange. Sisson had used his own head to break down the Major's door, um, using it as a battering ram in order to capture the guy. All right, so just really being a general badass. It has been estimated that in contrast to the 5,000 African Americans who fought on the side of the Americans during the Revolutionary War, roughly 15,000 black loyalists fought on the side of the British and 75,000 to 100,000 African Americans sided with the British. Now, why would this be? Well, it seemed from the very outset of the war that it was with the British that African Americans were most likely to gain their freedom. The first group was enlisted by Virginia's royal governor, John Murray, the Earl of Dunmore. The Patriots had driven him out of office in 1775. And in November 1775, he published a broadside known as Lord Dunmore's Proclamation, in which he promised freedom to all, quote, indentured servants, Negroes, or others appertaining to rebels, able and willing to bear arms for the British. Slave volunteers had sought to join Dunmore even before he issued his proclamation, but he worded the proclamation carefully so that it would limit recruits to those enslaved people belonging to the rebel, rebels. Between 1775 and 1776, about 800 male slaves reached Dunmore's headquarters. This disrupted agricultural production in Virginia, and now the Americans had to uh, fight two enemies and also struggle to uh, patrol the remaining enslaved people. Dunmore organized black fugitives into troops called Lord Dunmore's Ethiopian Regiment. The regiment wore sashes that read liberty for slaves. They spent most of their service rummaging for supplies, but they also occasionally saw battle and were nearly wiped out by Patriot forces in December 1775. They were replenished by new fugitive slaves, but a smallpox outbreak killed off many of the new recruits and their families. George Washington, fearful that more African Americans would fight for the British flag, petitioned the Continental Congress to make blacks eligible for service. But still, Enslaved people from New York and New Jersey responded to Lord Dunmore's proclamation. That is, people from the mid-Atlantic states ran to the British instead of running to the rebels. A 22-year-old slave named Titus ran away from Monmouth County, New Jersey, to join Dunmore's Ethiopian re regiment. Titus fought in the Battle of Monmouth, capturing the leader of the Monmouth militia. Titus earned the title Colonel Ty for his service. <clears throat> 
He organized his own commando unit known as the Black Brigade. Okay, so while many fought on the side of the British, uh, most people didn't end up in uniform. Black loyalists, though, built forts, transported mu munitions, cooked, made uniforms, acted as domestic servants for troops, drove wagons, and had to feed and shelter themselves. They built important fortifications used by the British during the war and also served aboard Navy ships, Royal Navy ships, and worked as spies. They were issued certificates of freedom in exchange for their service. Near the end of 1778, the British Parliament enacted a Southern strategy to defeat the rebels. Its goal was to crush the rebellion by retaking the South. The plan involved using the region's enslaved people to defeat the rebels and also afforded the British the advantage of more closely monitoring the French and the Spanish in the frontier colonies nearest to the South. At first, it appeared that Southern strategy had paid off. Enslaved people helped the British capture Savannah in 1778 and Charleston in 1779. In 1778, Sir Henry Clinton had become commander-in-chief of the British Army, and in June 1779, he issued the Phillipsburg Proclamation. This expanded the promise of freedom offered by Lord Dunmore's proclamation to include any enslaved person who would serve the British in any capacity. So that meant not only people who could fight, hold guns, but also Old people, women, and children started flocking to the British lines. About a third of those who fled to the British overall were women. Ultimately, however, Britain's southern strategy failed. The southern territory was too vast to conquer, and the Continental Army's use of enslaved people undermined the promise of freedom that the British offered. The failure of the southern strategy... Um, was also due to the fact that, you know, Southern loyalists thought, well, if they are causing a slave uprising against other white people, that's not something that we want to get on board with. So Britain soon abandoned the fight. And in 1781, Cornwallis surre uh, surrendered a large number of troops at Yorktown. So that was a major surrender of British troops. What happened? Uh, to the Loyalists, General Cornwallis did not protect the enslaved people who fought, fought for him. By September of 1781, his forces were starving, and he ordered African Americans to fend for themselves. A British officer noted one week before the British surrender that, quote, We drove back to the enemy all of our black friends. We had used them to good advantage and set them free. And now, with fear and trembling, they had to face the reward of their cruel masters. In 1782, Lord Dunmore joined other fight-to-the-end generals and appealed for 10,000 black troops. But British military officials resisted the request because Parliament remained committed to slavery. Statesman Edmund Burke, he was a British parliamentarian, told Parliament that freeing blacks was dangerous. Once blacks were armed, he argued, they wouldn't stop until they had, quote, made themselves masters of the houses, goods, wives, and daughters of their murdered lords. So what happened? In the end, the Royal Navy evacuated only 15,000 black loyalists, relocating them to Canada, Jamaica, the Bahamas, South Africa, Australia, and England. And the ones who were removed to the British Caribbean were not, in fact, free because, of course, there were plantations there where the British were growing sugar. The British also left behind many black loyalists and their families. In Charleston, people were diving into the harbor and swimming after British ships in the hopes of uh, being taken with them as the British were retreating and they were beaten back. Other black loyalists were resold into slavery in British colonies. Some fled to Britain, where they were unable to find jobs, and a few even ended up going to Britain's new colony in Africa, Sierra Leone. 
In New York, black loyalists were told that they would be returned to their masters. As a fugitive slave from South Carolina recalled, quote, many of the slaves had very cruel masters, so that the thoughts of returning home with them embittered life to us. For some days, we lost our appetite for food and sleep departed from our eyes. Some black loyalists in the low country swamps continued to fight until 1786. Fugitive slaves calling themselves the King of England's soldiers built a fortified village on Bear Creek near the Savannah River in Georgia. They raided nearby plantations until May 1789, until they were finally defeated by the South Carolina governor who sent in troops. Those black loyalists who made it to English territory uh, sent petitions to the British government for pensions or one-time payouts to compensate them for their losses. But Parliament was much more likely to ignore their requests than those of other loyalists because they felt like, okay, well, you already gained your freedom by fighting on the British side. What else is it that you want? You know, what can you reasonably ask for? Okay, so shorter way of saying this, anti-slavery sentiment had not really caught on in British Parliament yet by this point. What was the impact of the Revolutionary War? Well, nearly 5,000 African Americans who fought for the Patriots were granted freedom after the war. And this added to the growth of the free black population in uh, what was now the United States. In 1760, the free black, black population in the British colonies had only been a few thousand people. The population of free African Americans reached 60,000 by 1790 and 110,000 by 1800. Mumbet, a slave in Sheffield, Massachusetts, su uh, successfully sued for her freedom uh, as a result of the conflict that she pointed out between the new constitution of Massachusetts and the e existence of slavery. In the beginning of the Massachusetts constitution, the first few words said that all men were born free and equal. And she, Mumbet, who had run away from her master's house because her a mistress had hit her in the face with a shovel uh, in the middle of an argument. Uh, she represented herself in court and she succeeded in her freedom suit. Once free, she changed her name to Elizabeth Freeman and her suit established a successful precedent. After the war, abolition spread throughout the Northern states Vermont banned slavery in 1777. Pennsylvania followed with a gradual emancipation act in 1780. And even in the South, the free black population increased after the war. So for example, in the Chesapeake, that is the upper South area of Virginia, Maryland, and Delaware, by the 1790s, about 10% of the African Americans were free. So the Revolutionary War instigated important steps toward eradicating slavery, but it should be noted that 92% of the nation's black population in 1790 remained enslaved. So the Revolutionary War, a step in the right direction, perhaps um, really legitimizing some of that all men are created equal rhetoric, but with a huge gap between um, the ideal and the real. All right, see you in the comments.